and it appears that we are officially uh, live. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to another session of our Sussex Vision Seminar Series, as always, within the Worldwide Neuro Initiative. I'm George Cafedzis, a master's graduate from Thomas Euler's lab and currently a PhD student with Tom Baden. And as your host for today, I would like to once again begin by thanking Tim Vogels and Panos Bozelos for putting forward this ever-expanding initiative towards a greener and much more accessible seminar world. Having said that, allow me, of course, to get back to the reason we all gathered here for today and introduce our guest from Janilia Research Campus, Dr. Gwyneth Carr. Following her bachelor's degree on organismic and evolutionary biology from Harvard, Gwyneth joined Cambridge University for her master's on biological sciences. During that time, she worked under the supervision of Simon Laughlin on the resistance to motion adaptation in neurons coding optic flow, and from optic flow, she moved to the neural control and biomechanics of uh, flight initiation during her PhD in uh, bioengineering at Caltech uh, together with Michael Dickinson. In 2010, she joined as a group leader the Janilia Research Campus. And uh, in a couple of months from today, she will be an associate professor at the Neuroscience Department of Columbia. Uh, being interested in visually guided behaviors in her lab, uh, they employ a wide arsenal of techniques in attempts to elucidate the circuits and uh, mechanisms behind the escape response of uh, Drosophila. And today we will be hearing about their latest and I'm sure exciting findings in her talk entitled What the Fly's Eye Tells the Fly's Brain and Beyond. So without any further ado, ado from my side, please all welcome uh, Dr. Carl Gwyneth. The stage is officially uh, all yours. Thank you so much, George, for that uh, great introduction. And it's such a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, of course, given the title of my slide, you won't be surprised that I'm going to start here uh, mentioning the seminal work of Jerome Letvin and colleagues who in 1959 published this paper called What the Frog's Eye Tells the Frog's Brain. Um, and the idea that they were trying to put forward at the time was that in fact, the eye, the retina itself, was capable of doing a lot of processing, extracting only relevant information from the environment, and then passing only that relevant information onto the central brain, as opposed to, for example, just taking a picture like a camera and passing all of the unfiltered pixels of light and dark um, on to be processed later. And uh, in particular, uh, if you read the paper in which they record from different optical fibers uh, in the frog, they were very excited to find one particular type uh, of neuron that they called a bug detector, as it seemed particularly sensitive to convex moving, small convex moving shapes. Um, and so, uh, you know, to me, that really was one of the sort of first demonstrations of feature detectors, and in fact, just neuroethologically relevant feature detectors found in the brain, and has really inspired some of the ways we think about approaching how animals are using visual information and processing that to guide behavior. And so what I'm going to tell you about today is what the lab has been working on uh, along with some really close collaborators um, over the last um, five years or so, trying to build up a picture of what the eye might tell the brain and then trying to go beyond that to understand how these features distilled by the eye might then be combined and used to actually guide behavior. And to do this, we wanted to use a model organism that maybe had, was a little bit more compact than something like the frog or even something like the mouse, where there's also been um, you know, great strides made in understanding the encoding of retinal ganglion cells. And we, in fact, turned to the object of this frog's attention, which is the fly. So, uh, you know, one question we might ask is if the frog has a fly detector, does the fly, in fact, have a frog detector? And so uh, the fly is a really nice uh, model organism to study, not just because of the genetic tools available to use and to manipulate individual neuronal cell types in the brain, um, but because in fact there aren't that many neurons we have to look at, something on the order of 300,000 across the whole central nervous system. Um, as I mentioned, we can access these using genetic tools one at a time, almost for, uh, in theory, any cell type we want to get to. And then the, ne the new piece that we've been able to add to this arsenal as a field is a connectome. That is a, a diagram telling us how all of the neurons in certain parts of the brain, and soon to be the whole nervous system, uh, are connected to each other. And so the question is, how do we use all of these tools to understand this whole um, processing stream all the way from visual 
to motor. And so my lab has really been guided by an anatomical approach inspired by um, the sort of uh, perspective of Letvin and others. And that is to try to look at bottleneck populations in this whole path from light to leg movement to understand across those bottleneck populations what the representation of information is. And there's two in particular we focused on. One, uh, where uh, information leaves the optic lobe of the fly. Um, that is the area uh, here in the eye that has uh, about four different nerve pill, four or five different nerve pill that process information. Um, and then the other is uh, where information leaves the central brain and goes down into the ventral nerve cord, uh, carried by a set of descending neurons. And there's only about, actually we've revised that, that number upwards now, maybe 1,300 total descending neurons um, from both sides uh, in the fly. And so what I'm going to tell you about today is trying to understand something about how visual information flows through the brain um, into the nerve cord. So here is uh, a sort of cartoon of the fly's brain with some of the different relevant nerve pill uh, mapped. And you know, from the information we have now, this will surely be uh, refined and revised as we elaborate the connectome. It looks like there are about three major visual pathways coming out of the fly's eye, carrying information across about 100 different cell types. And so the first of these, um, is information going from the optic lobes into these kind of um, ventral lateral neuropils here on the, on the side of the fly's um, central brain. Um, the second are some pathways that go from a little bit earlier in the optic lobe all the way to an area right in the middle of the fly's brain called the central complex um, through several relays here. And then finally, there are some pathways that take visual information, again, early visual information, into an area called the mushroom body. And the central complex and the mushroom body of the fly have been well studied, actually, in other insects as well. And they're known to uh, play large roles in, for example, associative memory in the case of the mushroom body or navigation in the case of the central complex. The central complex actually has a set of cell types that seem to represent uh, the heading direction of the fly in its environment. Um, but what are these ventrolateral neuropils for? Well, the hypothesis that I think has built up uh, over the decades is that these might be some, this might, area might be some kind of sensory motor switchboard area. This is where visual information comes in and has some very direct connections to descending neurons um, in order to uh, more rapidly control some of the fly's behavior. And so um, we're going to explore some of those hypotheses today. Well, one of the things we can do once we have a connectivity graph um, of how neurons are connected to each other is we can just kind of take a very coarse look at what the motifs of that connectivity are. Um, so if we just look at um, how three neurons might be connected to each other, these are sort of the 15 different ways in which they can hook up. Um, and very roughly, again, this is kind of very coarse analysis, you can imagine there are some motifs that are sort of more feed forward in nature, some that actually involve feed back from the neurons back to the ones that gave them input, and then others which are more in this kind of loop structure are more recurrent. And so if we look at these three um, primary visual pathways, what we can see is that these um, ventrolateral neuropils tend to have more of these feed-forward structures in them and fewer of the recurrent or feedback pathways, especially in comparison to the mushroom body in the central complex. Um, and you can see that again here in this pie chart in terms of which, how, what percentage of the, the different um, triplet motifs are represented by each of these sort of flavor of connectivity. And so this is just to give you a rough idea that this um, VLNP area at large might be somewhere where we could actually gain a lot of knowledge with a kind of feed-forward analysis, which is what I'm going to largely talk about today. Now, in particular, um, the a type of uh, visual projection neuron that projects from the optic lobe into this VLNP are these so-called LC or lobula columnar neurons. And these are populations of anywhere from, say, 50 to 200 neurons that have these, um, each individual neuron is sort of, um, has narrow dendrites, a small um, visual field, and these uh, individual um, dendritic visual fields tile retinotopic space here in the optic lobe. But then their axons, as they project into the central brain, bundle and form these clusters or optic glomeruli. So each of these different colors here is representing the axon bundle of a different LC type. There's on the order of something like 20 LC types um, that have this kind of configuration. And with our collaborators, um, Michael Reiser and Jerry Rubin, um, along with uh, Alyosha Nern, 
um, Nathan Kropotke, who is a postdoc in my and Michael's lab, um, set out to examine uh, the visual response properties of these LC neurons in more detail, um, but across uh, as many of them as he could get good um, driver lines to record from, which is about half of them, about 10. And so again, this is, this is what the structure of these LC neurons look like. Here are individual members of each of these different 10 types um, that he is going to examine. And one thing to note is that these different LC neurons have different, um, have ramifications in different layers within this lobula neuropil in the optic lobe, indicating that they could be getting different kinds of um, vi process visual information. Um, and again, they output to these distinct glomeruli. Okay, well, roughly what he found is very similar to what they found um, in the frog, which is that different ones of these LC types seem to be detecting specific different visual features. So here are some examples. Um, there's a type called LPLC2, which is very sensitive to uh, looming or expanding motion. Um, and in fact, it's very specific um, just um, for looming. There's another type, LC15, which seems to be um, very uh, specially tuned to long, narrow, moving bars. So it's sort of a line detector. And a third type, LC18, which looks like it's a point detector, a small object detector. Um, and it's response to um, uh, points even potentially smaller um, than the visual resolution of, of the eye moving across its receptive field. Um, in other words, one could interpret that in fact, the fly has its own fly detector. Um, I won't say more about that today, but we could discuss the ecological implications of some of these. So, okay, here were three um, specific examples, but uh, as I said, Nathan did a whole survey of 10 of these LC types. And I'll cover this a little bit quickly because I think my colleague, Michael Reiser, actually went through some of this material in this forum um, about a year ago when it was just uh, hot off the presses. Um, but the way Nathan was able to get um, very precise data for the visual responses of these individual LC types was he found a place where he could isolate individual members of this population. That is uh, the, the, ac the start of the axon um, as it's leaving the lobula and entering into the central brain. And so you can see here three different ROIs for three different individual cells of this particular cell type, LC18. And what Nathan did is he would um, image from these neurons using the GCAMP6F, and for every ROI, for every neuron that he was focused on, he first did a kind of um, set of pre-stimuli where he found what the receptive field of that neuron was so that he could present all future stimuli as receptive field-centered um, uh, visual presentations. And then he ran a battery of, say, 100 different kinds of visual stimuli, um, all, trying to cover all the different basic kinds of motion, um, dark looming, bright looming, um, moving objects of all different uh, sizes, moving bars and edges, wide field grading motion, etc. And what he found was that uh, individual cell types, in fact, had a very unique tuning, so no, no two of these had identical responses across this whole battery of stimuli. However, to a sort of first approximation when we ran a sort of PCA analysis, um, the, the first um, principal component really separated these cell types into two large clusters, one that was um, responsive to small objects and one that was responsive to looming. Um, and so we were actually quite surprised to see that, you know, for the 10 of these LC types that we surveyed, nearly half of them were responsive to looming. Um, that's sort of saying that, you know, the half of the uh, um, retinal ganglion cells in the frog might be fly detectors, right, at, at a first order approximation. But as you'll see later, um, there's a reason for this, which is that, in fact, uh, these are not all conveying exactly the same kind of looming information. Okay, the, the next thing Nathan observed was that not only um, do these cell types segregate into these clusters by response properties across this battery of visual stimuli, but in fact, the clusters physically segregate. That is, the small object uh, sensitive LC types tended to be in this kind of more dorsal cluster and the looming ones in this more ventral cluster. And so uh, what that indicated to us is that perhaps um, feature detectors that are detecting somewhat similar features are more likely to be integrated downstream um, by downstream neurons that would want to integrate um, from spatially nearby um, partners. And so that's what Nathan looked at next. He looked at individual pairs of these um, different uh, types of LC neuron, these visual projection neurons. He meant, this is what we can do in the fly that is very difficult to do in maybe larger brains without a connectome. We simply ask the 
graph of the connectome, what is downstream of these pairs. And so what he found by looking at the downstream partners is that in fact, there were several um, clusters of particular LC types that tended to supply information to a downstream partner with other particular ones. So how do we read this graph? These are the, the different LC types. And here he was able to expand his connectome analysis beyond the 10 that he had surveyed um, with his imaging um, system. And so um, each square here represents a pair of these different um, LCs. And the color of the square is telling you basically on average how many synapses that particular pair will supply to downstream partners. And so where it's dark, those two LCs don't have any downstream partners in common, and where it's light, they tend to have a lot of synapses they're giving in common to downstream partners. And you can see there's sort of roughly four clusters here, and um, some of the stronger clusters were ones as expected, where you know these are all the looming type of LCs, and they seem to be clustering together. So looming um, responsive uh, visual projection neurons were providing information downstream with other looming sensitive visual projection neurons. Where are those um, uh, postsynaptic neurons that are getting information from these visual projection neurons, where are they going? Well, largely they seem to be staying within these ventral lateral nerve pills. So this is consistent with that kind of general information flow I showed you at the beginning in that uh, for these ventral lateral nerve pills, by and large, they're not all sending projections then more deep into the central brain. Processing is happening here within those ventral lateral nerve pills and then um, largely descending down into the ventral nerve cord. Okay, well, let me make this a little bit more concrete for you and uh, reach back to a paper we published um, several years ago now, but I think it illustrates how this information is being integrated. So I'll give you a particular example. Let's take LPLC2 and LC4, which are two of these looming sensitive projection neurons. They both synapse on a particular descending neuron called the giant fiber. And um, we actually did this study um, early before some of the automated connectome analyses could just give us a graph. And so we actually had to go back to the original electron microscopy, microscopy data from which these connectomes are derived. And we manually traced the giant fiber, LC2 and LC4 neurons, as well as all the other neurons providing input to the giant fiber to really try to get a complete um, view of this um, one sort of synaptic relay. So here what you're seeing are you're seeing profiles of individual neurons in the uh, EM data set. And then what you're going to see superimposed are the, the tracing. So by connecting those profiles uh, in depth, you can reconstruct whole neurons. And so here in pink, the giant fiber neuron is being reconstructed. And in cyan and yellow, the two um, visual projection LC types. And so um, what we learned from this is not just um, the synapse count um, coming from this um, data, but also by looking at all of the inputs to the giant fiber, we could know conclusively that in fact LC4 and LPLC2 are the only visual inputs direct um, from the optic lobe um, providing significant um, synaptic information uh, to the giant fiber. And so that's going to be very important in the next step where we then try to ask, okay, so now we know the giant fiber is one of these postsynaptic neurons that's integrating a particular pair of uh, looming um, LCs. Why is it integrating two, and what is the particular information content of those two visual channels? And so because we know um, that the giant fiber is, is basically just getting its direct visual inputs from these two, we could do the following experiment. We can do a whole cell patch clamp recording from the giant fiber, and that is guided by the fact that we have these um, cell type specific um, genetic lines that let us target the giant fiber soma specifically. And so what you're seeing here is a head fixed fly. We stick our electrode in the back of the head. We target um, the fluorescing cell body. And then this is a recording of the giant fiber's membrane potential. And we're gonna show this fly a looming visual stimulus at the same time. And so our data looks something like this. In this case, when the giant fiber fires a single spike, that is when the fly takes off and uh, uh, launch, would have launched itself off the ground if we're not head fixed. Okay, well, so this is the experiment we can now do. We can now silence LPLC2. We do this by, again, using our genetic tools to express an inwardly rectifying potassium channel in LPLC2. This hyperpolarizes it, effectively silencing its input. Or we can do the converse. We can silence LC4. And in either case, when one is silenced, we're going to record from the giant fiber 
and we're going to interpret our um, responses that we read in the giant fiber as being only through the active channel and not from the silent channel. And so again, long story short, because this is work that's published, um, so if you're interested in the details, uh, you're welcome to read further. What we found is that in fact, LC4 input to the giant fiber seems to correlate almost exactly with the instantaneous angular velocity of the loom. That is how fast the size of the um, looming object on the fly's retina is changing, is expanding. Um, and so you can see that here, what these different colors are, are these are responses from the giant fiber when only the LC4 channel was active, responses to loom, and the different colors are different speeds of loom. So it didn't matter whether the looming was slow or the looming was fast, in all cases this response aligned very closely with the angular, instantaneous angular velocity. Well, if you try the same analysis with this same um, optic variable for the LPLC2 input, when we silence the LC4 channel, what you can see is for these different speeds of loom, again represented in these different colors, and I should say that these are average traces of many, many trials across many flies, um, they don't overlay, indicating that you don't get a faithful relay of the angular velocity of the loom through this LPLC2 channel. And instead, if you put on the x-axis just the instantaneous size of the looming object, in this case it was a disk, you see that now um, our different recordings, our, our responses to different um, looming speeds do overlay. In other words, this is uh, supporting evidence that LPLC2 is in fact representing to the giant fiber downstream the instantaneous disk size um, on the fly's eye. And these uh, were optic variables we were um, excited to see encoded because they have been found in the brains of other animals called row cells um, or eta cells. Um, and for example, locust or pigeon or cat, uh, many other types of animal have these particular types of looming uh, calculation represented. And so uh, we were able to show that simply by summing um, these uh, row or eta computations, we're able to recapitulate here, you can see um, in pink, our model laying over the black um, average trace of the giant fiber total response in the control fly. And um, so uh, this was sufficient um, for us to feel like we had understood the complete primary visual input um, to the giant fiber. And here you're seeing that it holds true for these four different speeds of looming, which were what we tested. Okay, so um, that's telling us that one reason that you might want to have a lot of looming channels is in fact there are a lot of relevant different looming computations to do that you might want to assemble in different ways. In this case, what's happening is that LC4 representing angular velocity and LPLC2 representing instantaneous uh, looming at object size are combined in the giant fiber, effectively creating the percept of an attacking predator. And uh, when that happens, um, when both of these channels are on, so let me flip to this fast attack case, when both of these channels are on, then the giant fiber um, is driven to fire a single uh, action potential, and that is sufficient to activate um, in the fly uh, a rapid takeoff in which it doesn't raise its wings, it simply extends its legs and jumps off the ground. Now, if I go back to this example, and in, in the case where um, the looming stimulus is slow enough that it doesn't activate that velocity channel, it only activates the size channel, in that case, the giant fiber is not brought to threshold, doesn't necessarily fire an action potential, and other descending pathways um, do get some of this information, potentially processing it in a different way, but they coordinate a different kind of takeoff in which the fly takes its time, elevates its wings, and is more coordinated in the air. And so um, I just like to show this video kind of illustrating how in the fly, we really can go all the way from processing in the optic lobe to develop these features, which I didn't talk at all about today. There's plenty of people in the field working on that. How these, what these features are then that are being represented to the central brain, and then how that's being carried further and actually integrated. And so here's kind of the overview cartoon, as it were. A predator comes in, and these two visual feature detectors for looming are activated in the optic lobe. Um, they come together to provide input to this giant fiber. The giant fiber actually synapses directly on that yellow motor neuron, um, which activates the jump muscle in the thorax of the fly. That's what gets the legs to extend. And then through an interneuron, there's another set of motor neurons that activated, um, which uh, drives the wings to depress starting the flight motor. And so that's how you get this kind of coordinated fast escape. Okay, so I hope that gives you 
um, one sense of how in the fly um, we can take this broad view of how features are represented and then go into individual examples trying to link all the way to behavior um, and ecologically relevant behaviors of the fly and how they're actually being used. Um, so what I want to do is I want to spend um, the next part of the talk telling you about another specific example that looks at completely orthogonal information and how that might be, be being passed from the optic lobe to the central plane and then actually used by the fly. That is, I just talked to you about specific spatiotemporal features that the fly might be interested to detect. But what about object location? Uh, where objects are in the world is incredibly important to animals for all sorts of reasons, whether it's that they need to move towards them to find mates or food, or whether it's that they want to move away from them in the case I just showed you of the fly evading the predator. And so how is that spatial location actually being conveyed to these downstream circuits? And okay, let me tell you a little bit about why this might be a mystery, or at least was when we started. And that has to do with retinotopy in the visual system. So uh, as I pointed out uh, a little bit in passing when I introduced the lobular columnar neurons to you, the lobular columnar neurons, which are these feature detectors, have these narrow dendrites, which look at these um, small portions of the visual field. And they're arrayed within and slightly across these um, columns, this columnar arrangement that's in the early visual system. So uh, the fly actually has a compound eye, which means it's a composition of seven to 800 um, individual lenses. Um, these lenses um, then, uh, this columnar arrangement is then passed down to subsequent neuropil such that each of these different columns is processing information from a different part of visual space. So that is all very well organized. And um, back here in the lobula, as well as in the lobular plate, which is pictured here um, in this nice um, picture from Axel Borst, um, the visual projection neurons, their dendrites are also uh, aligned within these columns. So that is our LC neurons are getting retinotopic information on the input side. However, uh, work we did um, with Michael uh, Reiser and Jerry Rubin, and especially Alia Shinern, who did this analysis um, back in 2016, looked at the output of these lobula columnar neurons in the central brain. And what he found was that, in fact, there did not seem to be any retinotopy retained in these axon terminals in the central brain. So that's illustrated here um, just for LPLC2. You can see what Alyosha has done is he's um, colored different individual LPLC2s that are retinotopically arranged in this um, lobula structure in the optic lobe, but then he's carried those colors forward into the central brain, and you can see that they intermingle, indicating there's no obvious retinotopic structure. Now, I will say that a few years later, um, Michael Reiser's lab had a nice follow-up paper looking particularly at LP LC6 that did seem to maybe find some coarse retinotopy. So there was an open question of how might spatial information be being conveyed? Is there some organization here that we just weren't seeing at this sort of um, light level of analysis? Um, and so the work I'm going to talk to you about next has been a great collaboration between my lab and that of Larry Sapersky. Um, it was originated by Martin Peake, who was a, a really talented graduate student in the lab, carried on in our lab um, with some electrophysiology by Jin Young Park, and then really um, picked up by Mark Dombrowski, um, who is a postdoc with, with Larry at UCLA. But in some ways, the, the roots and the background of this particular approach we're going to take to look at this question came from my time as a graduate student in Michael Dickinson's lab, where we were purely looking at the behavior of flies evading looming stimuli. So I'm going to show you a video from that graduate work. In this video, a looming stimulus is coming from the left-hand side um, of your screen. And what you can see is this fly, which you're seeing in two views because this is a prism, so we can see the underside of the fly. The fly is initially grooming. As the disc can, expands on its retina, it's going to stop that grooming, and it's going to do a very precise motion of its middle legs here actually moving them towards the threat. That means that later, when it takes off, its legs are already in position to push it away from the threat rapidly. In other words, the early posture adjustment that the uh, fly did was preparatory in order to actually control the direction that it escaped to allow it to escape away from the threat. Um, and I like to point out that this is a, a very sort of common behavioral algorithm. Um, here is a man walking down the street He's about to encounter a very unexpected looming stimulus in the form of a car coming up on the sidewalk, nearly running him over. And what you'll see is that 
he actually performs exactly the same behavioral algorithm. It's going to play back in slow motion um, in a second. And you'll see that as this car expands on his retina, he leans over such that his legs are, his feet or the contact the ground are closer to the looming threat than his body. And then he can push off away from the car. Um, so this is a sort of, um, this postural adjustment is a very common way to control your direction. How is the fly actually doing this? Um, well, in Michael's lab, I looked at how the fly's center of mass was moving relative to its two middle legs, which are the ones that are going to actually push off the ground and send it into the air. And uh, what we can see is that before the stimulus starts, this average center of mass of the fly is basically just a little bit in the center and in front of those legs. But if we look after the fly has been viewing the expanding looming stimulus for several hundred milliseconds, right before it launches into the air to take off, what you can see is that now the center of mass is distributed according to the direction that the fly is going to jump. So that's what the colors here uh, mean. So for example, if the fly is going to jump to its left here in light green, its center of mass is already over towards the left side um, of, its, of its stance. And in fact, we could go into even more granular detail because we had these lovely high-speed videos capturing this postural adjustment at 6,000 frames per second. And what we can see is, in fact, how the fly gets its center of mass to those um, ending locations, which almost seem like target locations now, depends on where this, its center of mass starts. So this is a flow field in which the start of each um, black vector is telling you where the fly's center of mass started, again, relative to its two middle legs, which are represented by this vertical axis here. And you can see the black arrows point in all sorts of different directions, but they sort of seem to be moving the fly towards this location, where it is where it wants the center of mass if it's to take off away from this looming threat. And we could do that for all of the different um, uh, directions uh, that the fly um, is getting threatened from. And what you can see here in black, I've just uh, recapitulated those sort of target locations that we measured the fly moved its center of mass to before it jumped. And you can sort of see generally, um, at this point, um, we didn't have as much data when I, I was doing this as a graduate student, but in general, these um, flow fields seem to point sort of towards these locations. Okay, so the postural adjustment is, is how the fly is getting itself um, prepared to, to do this directional behavior. Um, and then just to reassure you that uh, we can quantify the directional behavior, and in fact, um, you know, not just in that one video, but flies do in fact tend to escape away from the threat. Um, here you're seeing each little green dot is a fly that took off. This is now data that we were able to start capturing um, more numbers with because we have an automated system for um, showing flies looming stimuli. Um, the blue uh, vector here is the looming stimulus direction, and the red vector is sort of the mean escape direction. And you can see that they're usually roughly opposing. In fact, um, we were able to just uh, write out what the algorithm is in order to go from the blue vector to the red vector. And that is, if the fly were to simply be trying to jump directly away from the looming stimulus with some bias to also be jumping forward. So we wait the forward direction a little bit. Um, and then that is what this is showing you here. That um, completely recapitulates the actual direction that the fly goes. OK. So that was a little bit of a, a digression back into sort of the background of this directional behavior the fly does to, um, to sort of preface uh, our investigation of how the fly is doing this and how is this act is actually getting this visual information about where the looming stimulus is coming from. Well, I started by showing you uh, uh, that many of these different LC visual projection neurons are looming sensitive. Here's a subset of four of the um, for the five that we had found in, in our um, earlier study that respond to looming. And then I already told you the story about how two of these, LPLC2 and LC4, um, actually sign up directly on a descending neuron, the giant fiber, whose activation has a takeoff jump, and the, the giant fiber is integrating looming information from these two. Well, again, going back to our connectome, it turns out that the giant fiber is not the only descending neuron in this ventral lateral neuropel region getting direct input from looming responsive um, LC neurons. In fact, there's a whole battery of them. There's at least nine or ten, and I'm showing you here the subset for which we have good genetic driver lines. And what you can see here is that LC4 in particular, and I'll remind you that LC4 was the one that was particularly responsive to sort of the speed, the velocity of the looming expansion. Um, that visual projection neuron in particular seems to connect to a lot of these descending neurons, in some cases providing even a large percentage of that whole descending neuron's input. That is what these pie charts are showing you here. Here's a little glimpse at what those um, neurons actually look like. So you can see they all actually have 
Uh, these are neuro, um, dendrites in the brain. They actually have fairly narrow dendrites. Um, and so what we did is we um, used intersectional genet genetic techniques in the fly to create driver lines that target individual ones of these descending neurons. That was actually an entire project led by um, Shigehiro Namiki, um, done about uh, four years ago now. And then we just simply activated each one of these descending neurons using those driver lines to see what would happen. And so uh, the very first pass, what you can see is just simply um, it does activation of individual ones of these descending neurons. It does seem to drive some flies to take off. Not as much as activating the giant fibers. That's what's shown here in pink. Giant fibers are DMP01. Um, activation of the giant fiber almost always drives the fly to take off. You can see the other ones are not quite um, as effective. But if you start to combine them, we just happen to have a couple driver lines that expressed in both DNP02 and DNP04, or 2, 4, and 6. Now that seems to start to increase the takeoff rate a little bit. And so I'll just take this opportunity for a slight aside for what I'm about to tell you, which is that I'm going to tell you a slightly um, more detailed story about two of these, DNP02 and DNP11. And I think often when we focus on individual ones of these neurons um, that have a particular effect, it's easy to think that the fly's nervous system is structured like a, a set of labeled lines. A looming detector connects to a jump detector, and that's the whole story. But I, I think you should just keep this in the back of your mind, that in fact, we think that these particular neurons that we tend to focus on for the individual stories are actually just components of larger networks of population that are actually um, encoding information more broadly, giving the animal even more flexibility. And this is where we're going to scrap, uh, you know, in the future, we've only sort of scratched the surface of this. Um, and so I won't talk more about populations, but just kind of keep that in context. Okay, so maybe a little bit of drive to take off from activating these neurons, but um, not a whole lot, especially in the case of DMP2. But remember, we're looking for directional behavior, and the directional uh, takeoff of the fly is driven by these posture adjustments. So how does activating these neurons affect the posture of the animal? First, I'm going to show you DMP11. Um, here's a set of different individual flies. At the bottom of your screen, you're seeing um, the red light that goes on. I should say, sorry, that we used... Um, our genetic driver lines to express a redshifted channel rhodopsin such that we, when we turn on a red light, the cells are depolarized. And so you can see when that red light is on here. And what you're going to see is that the starting position of the fly is frozen in green. And it's um, and the fly is, movie is playing over time. And so what you should see is a whole lot of um, abdomens of flies in green here, indicating that most of these flies actually shifted forward, um, is what activating DNP11 did. And there was a second one we found that had an effect on posture, and that's DNPO2. And so look what happens now when I activate DNPO2. The flies, um, again, the first frame was frozen in green, and so what you're going to see remains behind as the flies move is actually their head. In other words, the flies are shifting back. Okay, let me quantify that for you a little bit. Um, we just tried to capture that with a single metric, so we came up with this angle that we call the change in T2 leg angle, so just the angle between the center of mass and the two tarsal contact points of those middle legs. Um, if the legs are in front of the fly then that, and, and the center of mass is behind, if the, the fly is going to push backwards, then that angle is um, less than 180 degrees, and if they're in back, it's greater than 180 degrees. So for these different descending neurons that we activated, this is what that change in angle looks like over time. And so what you can see is most of these lines aren't affecting this forward-backward posture, but DMN11 drives the fly to move forward, DNPO2 drives the fly to lean back, and if we look at our combination lines um, with DN DNPO2 in them, um, they also drive the fly to lean back. And this is, um, we can superimpose them here, so you can sort of see uh, the difference compared to the control more directly. Okay, so that's the postural adjustment. Well, does this actually lead to the directional takeoff? Um, in fact, it does. Um, for DNP11, so this is now the takeoff direction of the fly. The fly is facing towards the top of the screen. Um, for, uh, you know, dozens or a couple hundred flies, depending on the genotype, DNP11 activation causes the fly to shift forward and jump forward. For DNP02, DNP02 alone causes the fly to lean backwards, but we need that co-activation with DNP04 to actually get the fly to take off, and in that case, it takes off largely backwards. Um, but you can see here, activation of DNP04 alone doesn't drive the fly to jump backwards. So we think that the way this is working is that P02 is responsible for that posture shift, but that you need that co-activation with some other DNs in order to actually um, get the fly to take off. Okay, so these seem to be um, two of the descending pathways that are involved in um, the motor side of this directional behavior.
Um, what about the inputs? So remember, these particular descending neurons were chosen because they're ones that we know get synaptic input directly from LC4. Um, however, LC4's um, optic glomerulus was not one that when we first looked at it had any um, really obvious retinotopy in it. So how is it that information about the location of the stimulus, which is what we hope is um, going to be hooked up to this motor program to jump forward or backward, is actually being conveyed? Well, using our conectomic data, we looked at the synaptic um, connections between LC4 and these two different descending neurons. And so what you're seeing here are individual LC4 neurons on the x-axis, so there's 55 of them, and they're ordered now in terms of the number of synapses they make onto DNPO2, that's the one that drives the fly to lean backwards. And then the same identity of the LC4 neuron is retained, but now in red we've plotted the number of synapses that, that neuron, that particular LC4 neuron makes with DNP11. And so what you can immediately see is, first of all, individual LC neurons are not making the same number of synapses with DNPO2. There's a wide range, all the way from nearly zero, um, in the case of onto DNPO2, all the way up to nearly 50. And that their synapse, the number of synapses they make onto the two different descending neurons are also very different. And in fact, they look like they are opposite gradients. That is, a particular LC4 neuron that makes very few synapses with DMPO2 makes a lot with DNP11. Um, if we do the same kind of analysis with DNPO4, so now DNPO4 is in red, you can see you don't get exactly that um, same sharp opposing gradient. So there seems to be something kind of special about PO2 and P11 with regards to their connectivity to DNPO4, or sorry, to LC4. So we wanted to look at this, um, uh, visualize this a little bit more directly. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take these um, gradients of synaptic number, and we're going to color each LC according to the number of synapses it makes onto a particular descending neuron. And then the view we're going to take is we're going to now go back to the optic lobe where the dendrites of those LC neurons are, and we're going to look at whether there's any spatial arrangement um, of the dendrites according to the number of synapses they make onto the postsynaptic descending neuron. All right, so that's what, this is what this looks like. Um, in the case of DNPO2, um, we're now looking at a lateral view, so sort of straight on to the fly eye here, uh, of the lobula, of the dendrites of LC4 in the lobula, that's, that's what's colored. And remember, the red color means a lot of synapses, the blue color in this case means almost no synapses. And so what you can see is that there's basically a hot spot in the anterior portion um, of the lobula here, in that, um, LC4 neurons that have anterior um, uh, visual fields tend to have a lot more synapses with the descending neuron that makes the fly lean backwards. And the converse is true um, for the LC4 neurons, uh, sorry, that synapse onto DMP11, which makes the fly jump forward, they tend to get more input um, from the back of the eye. Okay, so um, that made a lot of sense and it was kind of exciting to see for us. Um, but of course, there's still this lingering question um, a connectome is a great starting place, but it really, in the end, tells you nothing except for maybe where to look, because the question is, are these um, synaptic numbers actually synaptic weights? Does this actually get translated into the function um, of the physiology? And so we set out to try to measure that directly. Um, we have a setup, which I showed you a little bit of a video of earlier, in which the fly is head fixed, and we stick an electrode in the back um, of its head. Um, and this was uh, Jin Young Park who, uh, and Martin who are doing these recordings. But what you can see, I think, illustrated nicely in this picture from, from Gabby and Michael Dickinson, is that it's very difficult in this configuration to show the visual stimulus everywhere um, around the fly's head, simply because of the block uh, of this platform. And so what we're going to do is we're going to show um, visual stimuli in as wide a range as we can, um, but and then we're going to use a model um, to see uh, what part of the gradient uh, we were in um, and whether we recapitulated that, and then to try to extrapolate um, what the functional response would be across the whole eye, given the responses we measured across a narrow, more narrow portion of the eye. And for that modeling part, um, we were very grateful to team up with Art Zhao in Michael Reiser's lab, who applied the same modeling technique that he had in a paper from Michael Reiser's lab um, in 2020 um, by Mai Morimoto. So he reapplied this technique in which he could look at um, 
these other neurons coming from the medulla, which he knows how they line up um, in an absolute visual space. He could correspond that in our uh, connectome, in our EM data, with the LC4 neuron dendrites that we had traced. In order to be able to project onto visual space, these are the outlines of the dendritic fields of every particular LC4 neuron. And remember from the connectome, we know for every one of these um, fields, and now we know where it's looking, we know how many synapses it makes onto the, um, of the postsynaptic descending neuron. Okay, and then we're gonna show a battery of looming stimuli going across this anterior or posterior axis. And this, this square shows you the small portion of the actual visual field in which, given the constraints, we were actually able to show visual stimuli. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna see if there's different responses. Okay, so this is um, what our setup and our stimuli look like. And here are some um, average traces from basically uh, four different experiments. One in which Jin Yang recorded from uh, DNPO2, oh sorry, two different experiments. One in which he recorded from DNPO2, but showed um, either uh, anterior 32.5 degrees or more posterior visual stimuli. And another in which he did the same for DNP11. So already you can see that these um, the red and the blue traces um, seem to have uh, different um, heights depending on the location of the stimulus. And we can summarize for you the results across many flies and many trials, um, which is that uh, if you look at the spike number or if you simply look at sort of the area under this curve, in both cases, we seem to get the right trend. That is, DNPO2 was more responsive to these anterior looming stimuli and DNP11 was more responsive to the posterior looming stimuli. Okay, so then to go forward with uh, the modeling exercise that Art and Michael Reiser's lab did, here are his um, predicted sort of representations of the synaptic gradients um, based on the locations of the actual LC4 dendritic field. So Dark is showing you um, where the, we predict the DNPO2 would be more responsive and light where it'd be less responsive. And then here we're showing you um, for response of the, the model, how it compares to the data. So the model's in, in solid and the data, which is what I just um, showed you here, the area under the curve, um, is dashed. And you can see that, again, across this narrow portion of the, of the visual field, um, they seem to sort of roughly uh, correspond. And so then we're able to use the model to extrapolate then um, what, if these weights are functional, that would mean in terms of the response of these downstream neurons and, and sure enough matching the expectation from sort of the gradients we observed and running through the sort of physical spatial model of where the receptive, where the visual fields are actually looking in space, um, we can see that DNP, DNPO2 is um, predicted to respond much more strongly to anterior looming stimuli and DNP11 to posterior looming stimuli. Okay. So uh, we think that these synaptic number gradients are actually synaptic, functional synaptic weight gradients. And putting that together then for this particular story, um, what we see are that we have two different descending neurons, both getting input from LC4, um, which was responsive to looming velocity, that they're filtering that information through these different spatial gradients, which then um, are what is translating the location of the object effectively for the downstream neuron such that when you have a looming stimulus going through these filters, you get out the appropriate behavior, either jumping forward um, or jumping backwards. Um, and then in just the last couple minutes, I just wanted to um, show you how Mark and Larry were able to extend this work, asking the question, well, is this actually a general phenomenon of this interface of what um, the eye is projecting to the brain through these LC neurons, or is this very specific to this case? escape forward or escape backwards. There's a tendency to think that that might be a very specialized case. And so um, let me just show you some of what Mark was able to find. He looked now at all 20 of these different LC types, and he just simply asked, if we use the connectome to look at their downstream partners, do we see even connectivity between um, members of a given type with downstream partners, or do we see preferential connectivity? That is what I showed you with the DNPO2 and the DNP11. An individual LC neuron is making more synapses with one and fewer synapses with another. And then he was going to visualize that by showing different clusters um, of how that differential um, connectivity um, might, might show up. So what you're looking at here is you're looking at, again, lobula um, projections of the dendrites of individual LC types and they're colored now by clusters that tend to make the same um, number 
of synaptic connections with downstream partners. So in the case of LPLC2 here, these orange ones are all make, having similar profiles of projections onto downstream partners, but they're distinct um, from these blue LPLC2 neurons. And so this is um, simply to show that this kind of differential connectivity onto downstream partners is you know, clearly um, a widespread phenomenon of these LCs. It doesn't have to be. There are a couple exceptions, LC12 and LC17, which are sort of the two lowest ones here, you can see are very mixed up. So there isn't necessarily a reason a priori to think that you would have to get this kind of cluster differential connectivity downstream. But we looked further because this was indicative to us that in fact these gradients might be very common. And basically anywhere Mark looked, he could find more and more examples of cases where um, now you're again looking at the lobula and individual dots are showing um, synaptic weights of individual of these individual LC neurons onto a particular downstream partner, so in this case LPLC2 onto GF. And so th this is again a kind of gradient in which LPLC2 has stronger input to the giant fiber in the dorsal part um, of the lobula, the, the, the dorsal uh, LPLC2s do, but the ventral LPLC2 neurons um, have much less. And so here's examples across many of these different LCs of these kinds of spatial gradients um, being represented through the synaptic number onto downstream neurons. And so we think this is a pretty um, general way in which the eye is communicating to um, downstream partners in the central brain where objects are located. It's actually, you can't necessarily see it in the retina topy, um, but it's actually um, in the synaptic number. And just um, to show you one more um, last kind of intriguing piece of this, I said you can't always see it in the retina topy, and Mark did a really um, beautiful analysis where, in fact, he looked for it. And um, he did this by looking at um, either using the connectome data, which is what's shown in these left two panels, or actually doing um, flipped out imaging of individual LC neurons and following uh, where they go. He looked at anterior versus posterior or dorsal versus ventral um, members of these different LC groups to see then in the in their projections in the central brain and the glomerulus, whether they were segregated or not. And so he did find some examples, and actually LC4 is one, in which there is, even though it's hard to see um, at a course level, if you look in, in detail, there is actually some retinotopic organization. Here you can see um, the red neurons that are on the anterior side, um, right? They tend to terminate on one particular side of the glomerulus and the uh, posterior ones on the other. And that was true for several other LCs as well. You get this nice retinotopic segregation, at least along this one axis, um, in the glomerulus. But in fact, these pro did prove to be the exception. Even carrying this more detailed level of examination into the glomerulus for these other glomeruli, what he found is that the majority of the LCs have these um, non-retinotopically arranged, uh, again, at least at the level of this deeper resolution, um, organization. Um, of their uh, axon terminals. And so here's the sort of summary of, of which ones are, are retinotopic um, and which ones aren't. And so um, this is where uh, we really think that, again, it's actually sort of hidden um, in that synaptic number um, that the uh, object location is getting translated um, into, uh, into uh, information that the downstream central brain neurons um, can process further. Okay, let me just really quickly summarize uh, what I talked to you about today. Um, stepping back, we looked at um, the pathway sort of through this um, ventral lateral neural pills, sorry, my arrow got, got flipped, it should go this way, from the eye into the central brain, um, focusing sort of particularly on this pathway and asking, you know, what does the eye tell the brain and then what does the brain do with that information? Um, starting out with this, um, you know, a hypothesis that maybe there's some kind of feed forward um, sensory motor processing going on here that we could actually um, get purchase on. And so I showed you that um, LC and neural types do convey a set of 20 distinct visual features to the central brain, that um, the 10 of these that we looked at more closely could be coarsely clustered by whether they detect small objects or looming, um, so sort of the first principal components, and that um, they're also spatially organized in the central brain, their terminals, such that neurons uh, detecting similar features are actually physically closer to each other, um, neighboring in the central brain. I then showed you an example of then what does the brain do with those features? How is it integrated? And how there's actually um, different computations being represented by these different features, in one case 
a looming velocity, in another case, a looming size, and that these get integrated by downstream neurons like the giant fiber in order to enact specific rapid behaviors. Um, we then talked about retinotopy. Well, here's an orthogonal piece of information, object location. How is that being communicated um, from the eye to the brain? And we saw that retinotopy is actually only preserved in a few of these LC output primarily, uh, and it's usually lost. However, by using a sort of synaptic gradient mechanism, um, so precise numbers of connections onto downstream neurons, um, that information is retained. Um, and that um, uh, I showed you then a particular example of not only how that information is being retained, but how it's being used by the fly to direct appropriate actions. And so I think what you were seeing there when you were looking at um, the LC neurons make these spatial gradient synapses onto these different descending neurons that promote forward and backward jumping, you're really seeing there the sensory motor interface, the transformation of that visual um, information into the motor directive. Okay, I want to make sure to thank everyone uh, in the lab who I've had the pleasure to work with in my time at Janelia, both the current lab and the past lab, um, as well as all of our collaborators um, and the many, many um, great um, groups at Janelia that we've had the privilege to work with, and also, of course, our UCLA collaborators, Mark and Larry. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gwyneth, for this very interesting uh, talk, uh, fantastic breadth and uh, granularity of the pathways that you are so carefully dissecting and interrogating, if I may use these words. Uh, I will be posting the Zoom Room link that we are currently using so people can join us already if they wish. Uh, and the first question that uh, appears is from uh, Tom. It is related to the last part of your talk with this uh, synaptic weight arithmetic and uh, the architecture of the circuits. And the question is the following. The synaptic gradients look great, but I wonder if numbers along are enough. What about a synapsis actual weight? Can you measure that? Does it matter? And might that change over time, adaptation, brain state, circadian, and so on? Yeah, I mean, it's always what was a little bit surprising to us about how cleanly it worked out in our one example, right? You can imagine... Um, there's lots of ways to change synaptic weight, the size of the actual synapse, the number of vesicles you're docking, you know, all sorts of um, ways that you could affect that. And at least in this one example, the number, and at least again in the fly, so this could be different in different animals, the number really seemed to provide an explanation for a large you know, percentage of what we we're seeing. It matched the model um, very closely. So uh, sure, I agree with you that it's probably not the whole story. Um, but as we get more and more examples, I, I think it, I would form the hypothesis that it's actually one of the primary parameters that the nervous system is twiddling, at least in these innate circuits, um, for, for controlling that synaptic weight. Mm -hmm. The second one is from Simon Laughlin. Uh, do the gradients ensure that the centroid of an object is computed independent of size and position? Oh, yeah. Um, do the, the gradients. Um, so the interesting thing about the looming um, LC neurons in particular is that the object really does have to be centered on the receptive field, um, just the, the way they integrate, um, which we've looked in a little bit more detail, um, re requires that sort of precise location of the centroid, and perhaps explains why um, the LC, LPLC2 dendrites, at least, are very largely overlapping um, in the lobulate, so you get a lot of... Um, uh, you get a higher granularity of like where that centroid is. Um, so yeah, I mean, we can talk, we can talk more about whether that, that, you know, how that plays out with the different kinds of information they're being processed. But, but yes, I, I mean, we do think that, that this is for precisely locating that, that centroid of where it's coming from. Right. And before I'm moving on to the next question, because you mentioned the overlap of the receptive fields of the dendrites. Uh, so like, this is, in stark difference with what we observe, let's say, in vertebrate retinas, where you have like each RGC, each retinal ganglion cell type tiling the retina, and the dendritic overlaps of the receptive fields are kind of marginal. They do overlap, but not so excessively as they do in uh, what you saw. So, uh, my question is like, do you think you will have like regional differences uh, with respect to the overlap uh, degree? Yes. In fact, that was again one of the surprises when we did the modeling exercise um, with art. So um, I, I kind of glossed over it because it's sort of a second order detail, but in fact, so we, um, when we look at the gradients onto DNPO2 and B11, right, they're an anterior posterior gradient, but because there are more LC4 neurons in the dorsal hemisphere, 
they're also sort of a hot spot that creeps up dorsally that wasn't um, as obvious until we actually like looked at the locations of all of those um, overlapping dendritic fields. So yeah, it, it, the tiling is somewhat uneven, at least in the cases we've looked at um, in these LC neurons in the, in the optic lobe. Thank you for that. So the next question appearing is from uh, Munir uh, Oslem Sevik, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing the name. Hi, great talk. Are the PLP, PV, LP, and AOTU modulated by dopamine that may be related to behavioral state transitions? Sure. Yeah. No, I didn't even get into um, all the behavioral state um, modulation that could be going on here and going on with these visual pathways. I mean, I think... Um, that is the next part that we're kind of excited to get into, not just sort of maybe population representation of some of these computations, but how those representations may either be altered um, by modulators such as dopamine or octopamine or serotonin, um, but also how that might help uh, prioritize some of the pathways. So uh, you know, this isn't exactly answering your question, but because um, we haven't worked with that particular pathway, but in pathways we have worked with, so um, descending pathways, getting LC, direct LC input that go down um, and drive landing behaviors, we see that there's feedback, which we think is at least partially octopaminergic, that basically turn on and off those descending pathways according to the behavioral state of the animal. So um, you can imagine if you're standing on the ground, there's, you don't want to activate your landing pathways, you sort of simply shut down those particular pathways. So it will be interesting to see whether that's true for you know, pathways going into the central part of the brain, if there's times when maybe not shut it down, but maybe you want to um, make them more prominent in terms of how they're getting integrated downstream. You could modulate that potentially um, with things like dopamine. Right. Uh, and as there are no more questions appearing for the time being in the chat, I will ask one last myself, and then I will be terminating the live broadcast. So we continue with people that are already here in a more uh, informal fashion as we traditionally uh, do. So my question is like within the glomerulus, do we have like interneurons that kind of, you know, control the signal flow in the sense if something is happening dorsally or ventrally and so on, like switch this pathway on, like enhance it and uh, switch the other off? There are, each glomerulus has its own set of interneurons. And then as you can imagine, there's also interneurons that go between the glomeruli. Um, so I, I mean, I like, I like that hypothesis. Yeah, I don't think that we, uh, we certainly haven't looked. I don't know that anyone has been able to look precisely yet at what those are doing, but I, that's a, yeah, great suggestion. Because I'm, I'm just trying to think like, what is the purpose of putting them in glomeruli if you don't maintain some retinotopic fashion in a big scale? So, you know, by putting, like segregating based on functionality by having some interneurons, you can always create small maps that are feature detector based directly. So like yeah. you kind of optimize, like you save energetically on that um, perspective. Uh, and the last one, one last question that appeared right now uh, is from Mert. Thank you for the nice talk. If the retinotopy is largely lost at the axon terminals of LC neurons, how do you think the uh, DNs seek out of the correct LCs to preserve the retinotopy uh, functionally? Yeah, so the, that was actually the question that we initially went to, you know, Larry's lab with, um, because right, this is a this is a fascinating puzzle for development. How do you actually, if there's not a spatial cue that's allowing these to hook up, or, um, you know, how are you actually getting these gradients uh, formed? So I will just say, um, you know, stay tuned because uh, it's something that we're interested in investigating and they, they have some hypotheses for how that might be happening. And with that, I would like to thank you once again, Gwyneth, for this uh, excellent talk and thank the audience for being here. I'm posting once again the Zoom Room link in case people want to join us. And at this point, I will be uh, terminating the live uh, broadcast. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.